All right, let's continue with um, the coding part for today's class. And so at the end of every class, you will do some theory, you will see some coding at the end. Right. So this code um, that you are seeing, let me make it a little bit... Still, okay. Um, okay. So this is code from the textbook. So what I'll be doing is, it's uh, C code. So I'll explain what it does so that you can compile it. So those of you who have done, um, who installed the virtual box with the developer options enabled for CentOS, right? You'll be able to compile this code. But I don't want you to just compile for compiling sake. I'm just going to go through what the code is doing. It's your first piece of uh, maybe OS code, system calls. Right. So at the beginning is a couple of imports. Some people know hash as, um, is it comment out? But this just means to include some system types, some IO, and some, a standard library. I'll put up, uh, but you can actually pull it very quickly. It's c++.com, right? In c++, um, c++.com, what they do is, they have a lot of resources for programming in C or C++. If you can program in C++, going to C is just going to be a step, maybe a step down in complexity. Because some of the things that are in C++ are not in C, and everything is just going to be, oh, my functions, uh, some includes, off you go, right? While C++ will have more O features, right? So C++.com is a good resource. If you go there, for example, and you say, oh, what is in standard I or H? They will listen and tell you these are all the methods and functions that are there. So whenever you see um, an including class that is being used, my advice is just go take a look. Right. It's very interesting. You can attend some interviews where maybe you did very well, happened to be for you, done well in the class. You go and sit there. They ask you, oh, okay, you know, we heard that you did use this book. Here is a piece of code from that book. Like, yeah, I've done everything. But what does that do? I don't remember. And so all of a sudden, all the, the grades you got put in some question. So as much as possible, don't be a spectator. When you see the code being shown, for me, if I were you, the libraries are at the top. Go and look and just say, oh, what, what has this library? What else is in there? Aside from what he's using it for. Right. Now, let's start with, um, it should be like this. All right. So when you do um, an include, so it's including some system types, right? That means that some of the types that you know already, like int and so on, there are some types that have been defined in addition for coding systems processes, right? or programs. So PIDT is a system type. It's actually an int. It's a lot of these system types sort of are ints wrapped into things, right? So this, when you actually print it, it will be an int. Well, that's what it, it is in the back end. Right, so it says, make me a process ID, so PID underscore T. Um, the next one is to fork a process. So what forking means is... <laughs> All right. At, at this point in the code, right, so a fork would be a system call, so the OS has to handle that. So fork means that he wants to clone himself. Now, this is very important. Once you clone yourself, it's just like uh, there was this Doctor Who episode where Doctor Who was cloned, and the real Doctor Who had the, the sonic screwdriver. Right? So it means that even though you are cloned, one of you will have something that the other may not have. Right? So in this case, what would be your differentiator is the PID. So when the OS does the fork on your behalf, it's going to give you back the PID for, right, so there are two conditions. If it gives you some ID, so just a sec. Right, so what will happen is the parent will get the child's PID stored here. Right, it's not, the child can't know who the parent is, so it's almost like if I went to clone myself, and maybe I have a certain social security number, social security number one, and I say clone. The child who maybe social security number two 
his two will be given to me in this Bible. While the child will just get what zero. So when he looks at it, so it's just like that episode. One of the doctors who's put their hand into the pocket and realized he, he was a clone because he did not have the sonic screwdriver. He claimed he remembers everything, he's Doctor Who, but he doesn't have the sonic screwdriver. Everyone knows Doctor Who without the sonic screwdriver is just not Doctor Who. Right? So it means that if you are cloned, maybe if you put your hand into your pocket, you will have the student ID. Your clone won't have one. Right. And it also means that now the parent knows the child's ID. But the child doesn't know the parent's ID. So anytime you call fork, there will now be two programs that are running. But within the code, so this is an interesting part. This if, right? If zero, less than zero was returned. And you'd see this in a lot of C programming. That whenever you ask to do something, they'll return to you an integer. Try to open a file, they'll return to you an integer. So if it gets a valid value, it'll give you a positive number. Maybe 100, 102, 106. But if it doesn't get any positive number at all and gives you a negative number, it means that it wasn't able to get the resource you asked for. Right? You also see this when you try and read files in C, C++, that if you count how many bytes, if it says zero, there's nothing. But if you get something like minus one, that means that something has happened. Right? Or if you do a find for some programs, when you do a find in text, if it returns minus one, it means that it wasn't there. If it returns zero, that's the first thought. So this is similar. If it returns to you a minus, it means that there was an error in the fork process. All right. The other one is, what if you get zero? If you get zero, that means that you actually don't have, um, you have an ID all right, but you are not given any extra ID. All right. So the process, there's a system call. So if you go through the system call, it's, there's one that you can ask, what is my, uh, my, what's my process ID? But when the system call fork is called, the, the parent will be given the ID of the child. So from this point on, if the child checks, so now the parent and child have the same code they are running. It's almost like you have been cloned and you are standing there. You're going to put your hand into your pocket and check if you have some extra information. If you don't have extra information, that means that what? You are the clone. If you have the extra information, you are the original. Right? So that is what these two are checking. If it calls you, that means that what? You are the child. You didn't get anything. But if you get, so this else means greater than zero, the PID. Right. I am just um, inventing to make it look nice. Right. So the parent can wait for the child to finish. You can do other things with this. That is, you can have a, some jobs, so that's some of the things we we'll do in class. We can have some jobs where the parent can set things up. Can say maybe I want to combine several files, but I know that the, these are the names of the files. Child number one, you work with these. Child number two, right? And that means that after the forking process, in the parent branch, it can do some coordination, but the child process knows that what he can go off and do something else. Okay, so there was a question here, and then I'll come up. Um, okay, so you would hear the word fork also being used on things like GitHub. Fork just means like a fork in a road. Like the fork. Fork means that there are some divisions. So you hear it a lot in OS circles or open source circles. So if someone says that maybe uh, Ma MariaDB has been forked from MySQL, it just means that they made a copy of it or whatever code they had and made another branch. So that's what it really so it's still in use. If, if you hear it, that's what it means. It means someone has taken the code or wherever they are, it's running off doing something else. Okay, so let's question up. So it's a system call. It will actually be another process, not a thread. So he's asked an important question, that is threads and processes. If we say threads, remember we talked about program counter, right? That you can have a memory space and there's a program counter that's going through. Knowing that, okay, the program is currently on line number one, line number two, three, four, address, and so on, right? When we talk about threads, it means that there is some mechanism to simulate having more than one program counter in the same memory space, right? 
So it's almost, and you could, in the past, when computers were in the advance, people were sort of simulating this, where within their own program, right, they will jump to one side, run the code for a bit, stop, jump to another side, run the code for a bit. That means the same program that's what, moving its program counter around. Hope you understand. But in this case, when you do a fork, you actually clone your memory space, everything. The other guy gets a copy. So now, if the child dies, it's, or the child does something to a variable, it's no more going to be with the parent. But with threads, when they split off, and someone starts touching variables, because they are still, so threads are still in the same space. So it's almost like someone with dual personality issue. He's still in the same space. So if he cuts himself and he wakes up, some nice movies like that, where the person wakes up, like, what am I doing here? What did I do? Or the funny one where you, they wake up with someone else next to them, like, hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> take, take your things. Right. So they are sharing the same space. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right now, so an example is Firefox. I use Firefox to explain, but you have to look at your task, your task list. If you look at Firefox, when you have multiple tabs, you don't see more processes in your task list. But for Chrome, the more tabs you open, the more you may have more processes that are listing. So that means that the user interface can be the same. So where it could be possible that they are going for a process approach, or they are going for what? A threading approach. Within Windows, let me see if this one has that option. Um, some of the Windows versions would allow you to decide whether or not new programs or new processes should be a different, um, what's it called, like in a different process or in the same process. So let me see if this one has that option. Um, should be under options. Let's see, under, it'll be something like open new something in, let me see if I can find it. Okay, here, you have launch folder windows in a what? In a different process. So it's possible that even within Windows, you may not always know if you are sharing a space or not, especially for the same program. So where I'm not sure what the current behavior is, but it will just be, so remember, it's just a system call. So they can just say, oh, if, if this variable is checked, that means anytime I open another window, it will start a new process. But of course, starting new processes will do what? Use more memory. Right. But of course, it's, it's more secure to someone say, well, because now the processes are separate. But if they are separate, the cost is your memory. Right. So if they all live in the same place, we usually consider them to be threats. They all live in the same memory. But the fork process here is actually going to clone the memory. Right. Now, there is another call after this. So there's also a call called exec. This, that's this one, right? What exec LP would do, so there are very various forms of exec. By exec, what it would do is, the child has started, but the child can't control his code. Realize that the child, if cloned or made from the parent, would actually be having the parent's code. So it means that he's going to follow along. So if he could, he's going to check, oh, if, and he didn't have a variable, there's nothing in there, if zero, he'll be forced to come to this line. And at this line, you see something very interesting, which is exec, LP. What this does is it replaces, I've forgotten the positions, I think that is the name of the process. This is the path. Forgotten what this now does, this third parameter. But exec LP, what it will do is it will replace the contents. So it means that a parent, if you've coded it well, can be somebody who wakes up, creates a child, and the child can replace himself and become Word. Or Word would exec someone else and replace the contents. So what exec LP is, it replaces the binary code so that he can assume a new identity. So in this case, the child is going to go off and do a, an LS, which will list. Right. So it means if you have, let's say, a web server and you are doing this, it could be that some of them could wake up, replace the contents, and become another program who could be helping. That's why sometimes you start one program and then it starts off multiple others. Right. And you've also seen this. Um, let me just show you this in action. Hope that this works. In Linux, there's a command called ps3. Let me see if it works or not. Um, view skilled mode. Time is up. Don't worry, it's just one command. Oh. Okay. 
S3 into Ma. All right, so the command is called PS3. And what it does is it gives you a path showing you who has forked off to become something else. So it shows that system D, system process started, and it, it keeps forking off different parts of uh, different processes. So it actually forms the base of the OS. So my, mine doesn't have anything complex. So my login is what I logged in with. I'm using bash. I did less with PS3. So you can see that this is showing you the whole, is it, is like the whole family tree. So anytime you do a fork, that means that somebody is someone's parent or child. Right? The child is going to go off. He can replace his contents. So if you have a command interpreter, that means that when someone types a command like ls, you do what? Call a fork. Find the binary. Say, okay, after the fork, exec and put this in there. And then that process can start. So that is what is happening here. Right? So um, I'll put this, but this code is also in your book. All right. To compile this code, you need to use GCC. Right? So you can save it as a file, something, something dot C. And when you say GCC, the name of your, your file may be um, my fork dot CC. Right? There's no compilation. I don't have the file yet. But if I type the code, the code is in your text. If you type it in into GCC, you can compile. This is compiling. But if you do GCC, it's actually GCC means GNU um, compiler compilation. It will look at the extension. So if you do dot .cc, it will treat it as a C++ code, right? uh, a C code. So there's dot .c, dot .cc. It will still look at those and say, oh, I think this is C code. If you do dot .cpp, you use a C++ compiler. If you do dot .java, you do Java compilation. Right? So the GCC is a group of compilers. You call it, you look at the extension and compile. All right, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.